so wild seeing a master class where everybody's home. It's so weird. Well, uh, I want to welcome everybody that's here already to our inaugural Greater North Texas Youth Orchestra Masterclass. Um, this will hopefully be the first in a series, and we're leading off with one of my favorite people and, you know, a absolutely legendary violin player in Alexander Carr from the Dallas Symphony. Uh, can everybody turn their cameras on and let's welcome. Hey, everybody. Let's see. Jacob and Daniel, there's Elijah, what's up? Sibby, Locke. Oh, cool. So, you know, represented uh, in our youth orchestra are two groups, a uh, senior group and a junior group. The junior group is usually up to about freshmen in high school. And the top group, uh, of course, goes up to seniors and plays masterwork repertoire. Um, we're really passionate about youth orchestras and I wanted to lead off by just asking you what, what importance do you put on youth orchestra? I know you've done a ton of work with youth orchestras in the past. So tell us about your experience and why what these kids do is meaningful to you. Well, I mean, first of all, you just, the first time I ever went to a youth orchestra was in DC area. I grew up in the DC area and there was this Northern Virginia Youth Symphony, which was sort of the big youth orchestra in the area. And for the first time, I saw all the talent around me. That was the first thing that I noticed. It's, wow, there are some amazing players around. And just what the general level was that I should have to aspire to at, at that point in my, in my sort of studies. Then later, uh, I think that being in all the youth orchestras at camps, it, just, it was like this building of this community. The feeling of just being a part of something bigger than just myself, bigger than just practicing at home all by my, on my lonesome. And being part of, a, of that kind of playing that repertoire with all my friends just was, it was incredible. I just, I love being a part of something like that. And even, you know, I'd say one of the best orchestras that I've ever played in my life was the Curtis Institute Orchestra where, where I studied. I mean, being in, and we were all young, but it was one of the greatest orchestra experiences I've ever had. So I think being in youth orchestra is, is a great thing. You actually, you feel like you're part of a, of a musical community of a brotherhood. And that takes you in the later part of your career. I mean, I still keep in contact with a lot of the people that I was in high school youth orchestra with. I'm still in contact with this day. In fact, my Juilliard pre-college group, we just had a big gigantic get together over Zoom. It was about 120 people that got back together after not having seen each other in 20 something years or more than that, some of us. So uh, it was really nice to, to have that feeling of, uh, of, yeah, I would say the best word is community. That's fantastic. As concert master in the Dallas Symphony, where do you try to lead uh, young violin players and a youth orchestra? I know that obviously as a, a teacher at Indiana University, you work with young people every single day. So what are some of the important goals that really outline where you try to drive young players? You know, I think number one, I try to, to teach everybody that every single person in that orchestra is important. From the first chair to the very last. A, a first chair player, doesn't mean anything without every single person behind them. And so every person, every single human being who plays in that orchestra, every part of that string section for me is, is a vital part of that string section. I also try to, to talk about how we lead in, in a section. I like to lead from the back and the front. The front leads by more example of, of motion and the back actually leads by playing a little bit louder and, some, and, and to really anticipate what's going on uh, uh, in timing. So I think if a section leads from those points into the middle, I think you can get an incredibly good uh, section sound and also a section timing. I also try to tell everybody there's an old Dutch saying, if you stick your head above the sand, it gets cut off. Meaning nobody's more special than anybody else. Concertmaster is just one violinist. My job is to lead everybody. That's my job. It doesn't make me any better, any worse, or any just different. It's a different function. And so everybody has their function. And when everybody does that within the communal group, it's an amazing feeling of just of everybody being musical, everybody contributing to the whole. And I think that, that that's one of the most important things I try to establish immediately. Um, I also try to, to establish when I'm working with a group, how to get sound, how to make the most beautiful sound, how to blend sound together, whether you're blending with each other right next to each other or the section across from you or with the brass section there's always that sense of keeping your ears open. And so those are the types of things I like to focus upon. Man, just like 
such deep knowledge. Um, we talk a lot about uh, how to improve. Mm -hmm. And it's a tricky subject that many students overanalyze, myself included. Um, can you talk about some of the elements that you recommend for young players as a, a practice routine? And I, I'm not hesitant to talk shop here. We have lots of string players. And so can you talk about, again, some of, for the students that are here that don't know, um, Mr. Carr's students are some of the most highly successful individuals in our industry. And they, like myself and others, define themselves with a practice routine. So can you talk about some of the routine elements that you think contribute to your student success and your own success? I think when it comes to, uh, I mean, practice routines, well, of course we have to practice our, our, our pieces eventually. But what's really important is, is developing a foundation of technique. From that point, everything can happen. But without that, nothing happens. And it's funny, a lot of people come to me and they're older, maybe grad students who want to get a job. And they come to me and they want to play their excerpts for me. But the problem with that is, is that they expect that, okay, I'm just going to tell them about how to play this short, you know, this shorter, this longer, this louder, this softer. But the problem with a lot of people is that when they're trying to get a job is that they haven't developed the foundation, the technical foundation necessary to maintain the level that is necessary to get a job. So the whole point is developing a foundational system, how we develop our techniques, how I practice that. First of all, I practice scales, of course, arpeggios, of course. Etudes, I try to keep my etudes for my students really basic. I mean, really basic, like, like uh, Sevchik etudes, where you're just like, it's about, you know, basically building hand frame for intonation, practicing intonation with, open, with a lower string drone, so that you always have a sense of like where your pitch is taping yourself it's really important even if it's just for your intonation taking your iphone out putting it out and you know it's hard to get sound from voice memo but what you can get is intonation and it's pretty much there if you're out of tune you're out of tune so taping yourself is really really important practicing with a metronome extremely important because you know we all have different feelings of timing sometimes we'll feel something naturally correctly and sometimes we're going to feel things on the fast side or on the slow side and it gives us an idea of how to sort of temper our own internal clocks to how to get rhythm. And honestly, one of the things I, I think about a lot is, you know, people talk about difficulties in music. What's hard, you know? We talk about what's hard all the time. Okay, but here's the thing. What makes something difficult is that it has more variables, right? So if something's fast or loud or high or jumpy or things that cross strings, or things that cross strings this way. All those things make things more difficult. But the reason it's more difficult is, is that it's harder to maintain the proper fundamentals of playing when there's that many more variables. When the simplicity is taken away and you've added all these variables, keeping your fundamental setup approach to the instrument is that much harder. But the answer lies in that. When something is more difficult, it is that much more important to maintain your proper fundamentals. And if you look at a great, not forget about music, look at great uh, sports figures. Look at like Michael Jordan playing basketball, Roger Federer playing tennis, uh, Tiger Woods playing, playing golf. When you see Michael Jordan make a shot, a clutch shot at the last second of the game, his every fundamental has been practiced to the point where at this point it's executing what he's always done. It's not about trying to do something different. It's about executing what he's always done. He's maintaining all those fundamentals. He maintains how much he jumps. He maintains his form throughout the difficulty. And that's what made him successful. Same with Roger Federer. If you look, you know, one of the most important things about playing tennis is keeping your eye on the ball. Sounds stupid, doesn't it? Very simple. Just keep your eye on the ball. Yeah, we all say that. But when somebody smashes a, a 150 mile an hour serve at you, trying to keep your eye on the ball, not so easy. So the whole thing is like you have to sit there and, and if you look at Roger Federer in slow motion, the ball approaches the racket and you see his eyes until that ball makes contact with his racket. That's why somebody's great. When people are great, there's a reason for it. 
When people aren't, there's a reason for it. And the reason are the fundamentals. What I love about the way you say that is you're giving everyone permission to be great. Yeah. Everybody has the possibility. You know, it's, I think talent is ear. A talent for something means you have an ear for something. It means you have an ear for intonation, an ear for aesthetic. I think that's what when we talk about talent. That's for me, that's what it means. Everything else is teachable. It really is. It's just fundamental techniques and then practicing those fundamental techniques. And if, I mean, one thing that people don't do enough, especially at, at all at, at a young age, and I was just as guilty of it, I promise you, is we don't practice slowly. We just want to rush through stuff and get through it as fast as we can. And that's the worst mistake. Speed doesn't come from practicing fast. Speed comes from developing all those fundamentals slowly and then speeding it up. That's beautiful. I, I couldn't, you, you couldn't have read my mind better. Uh, it's like a, we have like a Jedi mind meld going on right <laughs> now. Um, you know, I, I find as I've interviewed uh, now, I think you're number 17 in this masterclass series during quarantine. What I hear is the exact same thing, you know, from trumpet players and horn players that we hear from you, you know, slow practice, develops consistent muscle memory and yep. when the muscles know where to go they don't care how fast it goes yep. exactly and you know the thing is about also about practicing slowly that's so important there was a guy i know named Giorg schmidt i've known him since he was a little kid he's a great violinist and giggy said something on facebook he was like writing something on facebook once and i thought it was a, a brilliant thing to say he said that the practice room is the laboratory for courage and i thought that was absolutely genius because it really is. Here's the thing, going on stage in front of 2,000, I go on stage in front of 2,000 people every, almost like, you know, three or four times a week. Sometimes I've been in front of, you know, I, I played once at Constitution Hall, which was 14,000 people. Oof. I played at the proms in, in, in London Oof. and it was 7,000 people standing right in front of me live on TV. When you got pressure like that around you, you got to be consistent, and especially at that level. And so the thing is, is that we all get scared. I get scared. I mean, I think I know two people in this world that have like mastered the fight or flight mechanism: James Ennis and Yo-Yo Ma. Those two people, I've never. I mean, freaky. I have to say, with those two, it's weird. They're like playing. It's like having a beer in their living room. It's the strangest thing I've ever seen. But everybody else we get nervous everybody gets scared it's how you deal with the fear and that i have to say everybody deals with fear in different ways for violinists i can tell you how i have, how it manifests in me manifests in me bringing my arm close into my body fetal position protect yourself i come in close here and i get light with my left hand because you start worrying about intonation right those are the two worst things you can do on a violin You'll sound crunchy here, and then you'll sound impure and, and not solid here. So the first thing I do is I think, okay, this is how my, my nerves get manifested, and I do the opposite. I increase my weight here. I make sure this is open and over, and that's the first thing I think when I walk on stage. If I can do those two things, I take 70% of my, 70 to 75% of my problems away. At that point, I just play, and I let, let it rip. But those are, I mean, that's the thing. Nerves we all have. How you deal with those nerves, how they manifest themselves in your body and how you deal with that, that's different. It doesn't matter what instrument you play. At some point, it, it all comes down to whether you're willing to take the risk in the moment. And when you, when you jump, you tend to you know, miss less notes and play more beautifully than when you're timid. And again, I, I, I've, I, I, you're, you're blowing me away, man. You've never, uh, I've never sat with someone who was like answering my follow-up questions as I was thinking them. So it's just like, you're, you're just easy. I mean, we're cruising. Um, well, have you, ever, you know, have you ever thought, I mean, Michael Jordan, again, he was my, like, seriously. He very was, poignant, he was, right? With the, with the current documentary. Yeah. He was my idol growing up. He was my absolute idol. 
like he was clutch. And I was, I grew up in DC and I was a Chicago Bulls fan from like the beginning. And I hated Michael Jordan because I was in DC and I would like root for Georgetown. And when Michael Jordan took that shot, that last second shot in 1980, what was 1982, and beat Georgetown with that last second shot, I was mad. <laughs> But the thing was, he was just the most, what I love was his work ethic, but also what you just said about taking a risk. He said, you know, I missed, of all those last, I took so many last, thousands of last second shots, and I missed a lot of them. But those gave me the courage to take the ones I made. You know, and, and again, Wayne Gretzky, one of the greatest hockey players of all time, said you miss 100% of the opportunities you don't take. Absolutely. Well, it's so funny, you know, people always say that, oh, the Chicago style of horn playing is to take big risks because big risk, big payoff. I mean, I find as the, the, the longer I'm in this industry, that is not so much Chicago style as mountaintop style, you know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you just, it's, it's not, you know, it's funny in taking risks, it's not about putting yourself on a ledge and jumping off. It's just, I mean, I can tell you exactly what it feels like when you go on stage just do what you practice with no hesitation. Hesitating is what kills you. In any, whether it's brass, woodwinds, strings, hesitating is what kills you. Don't hesitate. Just do what you said you were going to do. We all make mistakes. We're human. It's okay. But what you have to do is do what you said you were going to do. That gives you the best shot to succeed. But you, if you hesitate, then every, you go and clamp up. Just let it out there. And it's not like, you know, when I say go for it, people say go for it. Yeah. Go for it can mean you spaz out, you completely spaz out and sound bad. Mm -mm. I'm not saying go for it like that. I'm saying stay within yourself, stay calm, execute what you wanted to do. Stay in the moment. Have zero expectations, but lots of hope. And stay in the moment amazing advice to simply do what you did yesterday yeah we That's all get on stage and we try to hit the 650 foot home run when we'd be just fine with a base hit yeah and you know that's the whole thing is that it's not about the home run will that can happen you know there are some days where like it's like michael jordan said again he was like he was like throwing an orange into a trash can it's like some days it's so easy but those days are rare <laughs> they ain't all like that. Trust me. Sometimes it's just coping. Sometimes, like, you, if you get out of there without making a scene, you're, you're, it's all good. I remember, <laughs> and this is, like, kind of a weird thing. But, like, I remember being backstage my teacher's 80th birthday. It was a big celebration where a lot of his former students were very successful. We all had to come back and play in this concert in our old school, in Curtis, where we hadn't played in 25 years, easy, at least 25 years. We all went back, and we're all successful, and it's like we're kids again in front of the old man. Like, we were so nervous, so nervous. And one guy <laughs> said, he said, you know what? As long as I don't pee on stage, I think, I think it's a win. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, That's we, awesome. all, we all felt that way. All of us were like, you know what? If we don't pee on something or throw up, I think we're all good. I love, I think it's so important for young musicians to hear seasoned professionals talk in that way. I, a big goal of these masterclasses for me is to simply connect the next generation with the generation that is the most successful. And, you know, when I went to uh, Chicago as a freshman, I thought that these guys were just God. And then we went to a uh, Rite of Spring rehearsal and things happened. And I was like, whoa, okay. It's not always perfect. And furthermore, like those guys worry that it's not going to be perfect. And that really turned the light bulb on that like, okay, we're all just humans in this endeavor. We're all just, we're, like you said, in some, some days coping, in other days it's easy, but... Uh, the journey is the same whether you are 60 or 6. Yeah, it really is. And, you know, it's, it's all that practicing just makes it possible. It just gives you that much. Every time I practice, and Hillary Hahn always says it's a great, also a great thing. She said, 
You can only have to practice on the days you eat. <laughs> so it's like, I practice every day. Gotta eat. I, it's, trust me, sometimes I don't want to. Sometimes, and I love practicing, but sometimes I don't want to. I don't feel like it, but I do it anyway. You know why? Because that's, that's what Michael Jordan would do. He's the right. first one in, last one out. That's what you do to be great at anything. Anything. That's what you do. It's really it's, it's, good advice. There's no other way to put it. You cannot. You, it's, like, it's like a diet. You can't outrun your mouth. You know? It's like you can exercise all you want. If you fill your mouth all the time, it's not going to lose weight. With practicing, you either practice or you're not going to get better. Period. It's really There's no, you, can't, you, can't out, you can't avoid work. You can't outthink it. You know what? I, Danielle Kuhlman said it best. She said, the shortcut is the hard work. Yeah. And that's the, and, but, it's, but it's, you know, once you start getting into it and developing patterns of successful practice, like it's, it starts being fun because you, you see immediate, you know, everybody likes immediate gratification, right? We all like that, right? Like for me, I have, I have dumb things that I like, like washing dishes. Like when I wash a dish, it gets clean real fast. Immediate gratification. For me, I love that. Vacuuming. I see it immediately get clean. It's fun. But when you start feeling that in the violin, where you start feeling like, oh, I can get better fast because I know what I'm doing and I know how to work. Like, and and when, I, when I hear you guys play, I'll teach you things about how to work, about like what things to look for, what are the most important things to look for. Because, you know, streamlining technique, it's down to like there, there's certain things you've got to do well. There are other things that can hang in a balance a little. But there are certain things that have to be exact that you can't mess around. It's got to be right in order to sound good. And I'll, we'll talk about what those That's are. That's a great segue. Um, kids, if there's any quick questions that you want answered before we start to hear some playing, we will finish up with a couple more casual questions. But uh, if anybody has a question, now would be the time to ask it. Bueller? Bueller? <laughs> Does anyone actually get that reference? They're probably too young for that. <laughs> Ferris Bueller's Day Off. It's a, 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 a teen classic. Yeah, I've seen that one. A Chicago classic, too. Exactly. Okay. Well, um, without further ado, can our participants just unmute themselves? And um, we'll start with our violinist. And I'd like each of you to just introduce yourself. So... Uh, um, hi, Mr. Carr. My name is Katie. Um, hey, Katie. Uh, my name is Katie Cox. Um, I play violin. Um, and today I will be playing for you part of Sarasate's introduction and Tarantella. Great. Awesome. Viola, let's, uh, let's just hear some introductions real quick. Okay, I'll go next, guest. Um, I'm Melissa. I play viola, and I'm a senior, so I'm not to college, actually. It's Great. Um, hi, my name is Audrey Tan, and I'm a cellist, and I'm a freshman in high school, so. Great. Hey, Mr. Kerr. Uh, my name is hey. Argus Grincy. I play the French horn, and I'm a junior in high school. Perfect. Awesome. So we will begin with Katie. And uh, I'm going to get out of here. And uh, if, if the rest of you will mute yourselves, uh, and we'll just allow uh, the two of them to work together and y'all have fun. All right. After you. Okay. I'm going to start at the beginning of the Tarantella. Um, okay. The better known part, I guess. <laughs>
Really good job. Really good job. Very nice, Katie. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> really good. So let's get to it. Um, I want to work on, I, I really want to hit all the things that I think that if, if you if you immediately improve these things, you're going to get that much better, that much faster. You have a great ear, really great ear. Your pitch overall, there's lots of good stuff happening. You have a really good ear for it. You have a really good ear for sound overall, and you have a very good sense of rhythm, like really good sense of rhythm. Now, let's go to the things where I think you can get better. Number one, setup. Um, two things about your setup, and this is going to apply to every violinist in the world. I find that, like, you know, um, when you're over the G string especially, we'll start on the right hand. I find that, in general, the distance between basically right here, sometimes, again, you close in your arm, especially on the lower strings. And what ends up happening is it just stops the vibration of the string. Anytime, if the string is like a vocal cord, right? If I'm singing, ah, I'm going across, everything's fine. The minute, ah, I go vertical, I stop, I first starts by stopping the vibration enough that it tenses the sound. The next point of what happens is when I start to cross that vibration, so let's say I'm pressing as much as I want. The, now I'm gonna press. No scratch. I'm gonna go a little bit now. Now it starts to tense. Now it starts to punch. And I find, especially on your chords, the there isn't enough horizontal motion across the string. So let's actually. Can we start? Oh, what's a good place to just do something like that? Um, something with lots of actually the, the G string stuff. The from there. It's not about raising your elbow or raising your shoulder. It's about your underarm being like a mouth, and the mouth always stays open. And what that does is it creates a horizontal path across the string. So if I'm playing the... If I... There, that's where it starts to crunch. Now, that's the first thing. So always try to have the... the Practice all, since there's so many string crossings, really figure out exactly the horizontal path for each stroke. That's number one. Number two, I find that your left hand sometimes gets the proper weight into the string, but sometimes it doesn't. And there's a pattern as to why it doesn't and where it doesn't. Number one, your lower positions. I find that your position of your wrist is too straight and sometimes too far back like that. If I were you, I would create a wrist position that is slightly out. Not this, obviously, but slightly out. Um, James Ennis calls it being over the string. I call it being forward. It's, you know, it doesn't matter about semantics. I wonder if, it's, if there's a way that I can go like this. Maybe, yeah, that might be easier. All right, so. So, when I am with my wrist, like this, I will put a finger down, right? As soon as I go to my wrist, wrist comes out. What ends up happening is I get all of the flesh of the finger, first of all, and the weight comes directly down. So that angle on getting the amount of weight is really important. If your angle is too far backwards, you can get the weight, but it's a lot more difficult, and especially difficult when you're playing something this fast. So angle is important. Can we try, actually? Play a G major scale, right? And what I want you to do is I want to sort of develop a habit. First of all, set up. I think that your violin goes too far low in the first positions. Now, no setup is going to be perfect. You have to always adjust a little bit with your arm. So in the lower positions when I play, you know, my tricep right here, I kind of lift the fiddle into the... Kind of lift the fiddle into my chin. So what ends up happening is it allows my wrist to come out. Because here, if I let it go down, the wrist can't come out and I get stuck. I get blocked. 
And I don't want anything, any joint in my hand to get feel blocked. So this is the, the etude I do for myself. Start with, you divide the bow in half. I want you to the first half of the bow, just drop your finger. Second half of the bow, so it's like, drop the finger. Second half of the bow, let the wrist come out and vibrate. So, like that. Can we try that for a second? Vibrato is good. Allow the wrists to come out. And eventually we'll take the middle man out and just go directly to that, that sensation of the wrist being out. But I want you to feel at first what it's like to change from your natural position to a, uh, to a more proper hand position. Now, when you feel, if you feel like your wrist is blocked and you can't really get it out a little bit, lift the violin with your, with your tricep a little bit. Just lift it up into your chin so from here to here. tell you all the things that it affects. Number one, gives you that weight going forward, which makes it easier. Actually, if you really want to know how much weight to put on a string in the left hand, can you try something? Play a B in first position. That note. Start with absolutely harmonic weight. There's no harmonic there, so you'll, you'll hear how bad it sounds. Increase that weight until the note is perfectly clear. So that weight, that note of being from you, that's how much weight is necessary on every note you play. So it's like, when you go, all that those fast notes, that's how much weight is necessary. How you get weight, therefore, is pragmatism. So let's try once again, lifting the violin. But you're over the note. Over the note here, and you can call it that. Over the note here, over the note here. And we're always over the notes. If this is volume and timbre, this is clarity. Let's try. Great coaching. Well, I mean, now, now, the, well, that's that's make one more immediately point. obvious. Wow. Wow. Second Great thing. job, Katie. Vibrato. I think you, have, you could have a, a really great vibrato. Remember this. Vibrato is just a joint break. You have three possibilities. One, the first joint of your fingers, that first joint, how much it moves. Second, the wrist, how much that moves. In case of emergency, your elbow, how much that moves. So what I wish you would do is increase the width of, the, of your, the amplitude of how much you move your joint. You move the joint a little bit too narrowly. If you could open it up, it'll sound a little bit more wah-wah underneath your ear, but that's normal. Just think of like the... Can you try it once? Just that scale. Open up the vibrato, let the and get that in the proper position, and then let that joint open without losing the finger weight. Better. Better. I think you know the 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 fingers that you're gonna have to look for a lot. First finger is always the hardest. 
first and fourth, obviously. Fourth, we're always so weak on the fourth finger. But your first finger, nobody thinks about how, the, how hard the first finger is. To get that joint, and all of us have different size, the finger after the joint. So you have to think of to get all of them to open the same amount. But if you start to go more the, if you start getting the openness of the vibrato, the weight in the, in the hand, and then getting this over, remember I was talking about some of the most important things that you have in the violin? Mm -hmm. Those basically what to practice, the most important things are, of course, being relaxed. You have yeah. to be relaxed. <laughs> you can't be tight. You can't have your neck tight. You can't do like this. You have to extend. You have to be over. But I'm telling you, being over the instrument here, being over the instrument here, two of the most important things you can work on a violin. Getting that weight that into the string with being over, being over, and then it's just the balance of weight and speed. You know? Because you're yeah. then you're Then it's just how much, what kind of sound you want. You want a little bit deeper, you want a bit louder, a little bit softer. Yeah, that's just the balance of weight and speed. But those are the most important things to practice. You already have such a good ear with, with pitch and with overall aesthetic that if you start practicing those things, I'm telling you, hey, it's go like this. Go like this. The last thing I'll tell you, when you have stuff that's detaché or spiccato like this that's fast, we always gravitate towards the bow arm as being a major problem. Yeah. What I would do if I were you, practice this slurred, and you'll realize just how much your problem is actually your left hand. Yeah. Here's a really weird thing that you never, do you, do you ever study physics? Are you old enough to study physics? Um, I, I'm a senior, but I, I haven't studied physics yet, no. Okay, so here's the thing. If you pluck your string, there's a vibration, right? And if you, this is called stopping a note. You stop the note. So what do you stop? You're stopping the sound. Stopping the vibration of the sound. When if you pluck it, it stops the, the note, right? And then we create a vibration here with the bow. So new overtone series, you stop the vibration of the string, and then I do it from here. Now, what happens if you don't put your finger into the into the string all the way to the fingerboard and don't stop the note? Where does the vibration go? It goes the whole length of the string. And what's on the other end? This. So now I'm trying to create a vibration against a competing vibration. That doesn't work. So no left hand control, no right hand control. So that's why I would practice this whole fast stuff slurred. Okay. But the slur will give you, you can practice two things slurred. You can practice this, making sure all of those things are together. I mean, everything that I have fast, I practice slurred. You know, the, there's uh, the scherzo from Schumann Symphony Number no. Two that every it's like an excerpt for. We always have them do this orchestral excerpt. Yeah. I practice it slurred because half the problems are the string crossings of the over, and the left hand playing weird intervals and string crossing. So if you practice it slurred, then you'll realize. This is so much easier when I play it fast because you're creating that legato left hand, which you need because it's forcing to, you're being forced to, because it's here. That was because my left hand was awful because I was popping out of the left hand. But if you practice it slurred, you avoid all those problems. But okay. this is how, these are the things I would work on. You have, you have, when I say talent, good ear. good ear. Thank you. That really helps. Pleasure. And just remember those things. Over, over, weight, practice slurred. Yes, yeah, thank you. Talking, I was trying to figure out how to slow fix that. And <laughs> yeah, you will. It'll get better really fast. All right. Who's thank wonderful? Thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Katie, great job. Um, yeah, very shocking. Practice slow and slurred. I've never heard that before. <laughs> yeah, and then fast and slurred too. Yeah. All right, Melissa. Okay, Melissa, let's, let's hear it. Cool. Um, so I'm playing Bach Cello Suite Number Three, the Almond. 
Great. And do we play like both halves or just like the first half or? Okay, stop whenever you want. Okay. okay. Yeah, it's, cool. it's just the first half though. I'm sure there'll be plenty there. Yeah, that's true. Okay. You know, it's really good. 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 No. Similar issues, actually. Number one, the left hand for me, of course, playing cold, like when you haven't warmed up, that's not easy either. So the first thing I want you to do, I just want you to think of a... Think about connecting the weight of your left hand. So the... All those things. Feel like you're... Your fingers, it shouldn't feel like you're grabbing. Don't feel like you're grabbing with the thumb or especially not grabbing with this joint. Always feel as if you're dropping your fingers from these base knuckles, that you're dropping from above. But the other fingers that can stay down, leave them down because it gives us exponential weight into the string. And we have to have that weight or else there's no clarity in sound. And what I find is happening is you're losing a little bit of bow pressure yeah. Because of what I just said to, to yeah. Katie um, about like the fact that your left hand isn't in the string enough and now for the, you're getting the vibration from, the, from there that's hitting your bow arm. And so you're not being able to get into the string enough. And I think with a viola, the thing about a viola, it's a, there's a wider street gauge. It's just a bigger instrument, right? So I think what you have to think of is that with that wider gauge, you know, some viola teachers tell you to bring it in. I disagree. I just think you have to relax your elbow like the... And then bring in... You know, does your teacher ever talk about contact points? Yeah. Okay. Just a definition. Contact point, all it is, is the visual cue of the balance between weight and speed that I was talking about with Katie. Mm -hmm. So the balance of weight and speed is, is going to manifest itself. I actually call it the friction point. How much friction is developed. The closer I am to the bridge, when I, the more direct the sound is because the more friction is gained, the more tension is against. And I think you're a little fingerboarding. So I would bring the, the, try to keep away from here. And, and what I want you to do is bring it a little bit in. It's not a lot, just a little bit in so you have a little bit more control of the friction. Can we start at the very beginning? And just yeah. the uh, feel that you're dropping your fingers from here, not from here, not from totally straight up. Still curve, but forward and down. And, key, and think that you're trying to connect the weight, that you're, letting, you're not letting the string come up for air. Okay. Let's try it. Good, even the make sure those notes even you can even leave your first finger down. So always feel that your left hand is connecting. Now, let's do it slowly once. The, 
Make sure that your bow arm moves. You're trying to figure out, actually, here's a good question to ask you. Who okay. said, this, is, this is a dance, right? Mm -hmm. And Alemanda is a, it's a German dance. Yeah. German dance where, where the fourth beat kind of holds, and then, so it's like, uh, like da 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 So it's a, a beat where the, the fourth beat holds, and then we go on. So we have to figure out how that relates to number one, the dance, the rise and fall of the dance, which you do very well, by the way. It, I feel the rise and fall of the dance. I feel like that you have the release of the, of the slurs, down bow slurs, which I really like a lot. All that's great. But, and I think that you're, it's really musical. So the question now is how to develop the technique to support the musicality. So first of all, who's singing? Let's say man or woman. Um, the man, I guess. Okay, so you have that sort of like more husky voice. Now, great, so you've got that voice. Now, um, do you think it's like, like a big gigantic dude or like somebody who's just like a little bit more mobile or tenor-ish? I mean, it has lots of energy, so probably like more oh. springy and like, I don't know. Okay, so, yeah. even, so in a slow tempo, can you give me what that voice sounds like? By number one, the... <laughs> letting the left hand be in the string and get the over and then let's just see what the voice is. Let's okay. find that voice. Okay. No, right there. Uh, I can't go that low onto the C string. find the voice of that low string, give it a little bit more depth to the sound. Like dum the when you go to the low, beat it on bum bum. A little bit more weight in the string. But the weight, not in the elbow, let the weight go from your forearm into the hand. Think of the elbow as a passive entity. It's relaxed. The upper arm is totally relaxed. So over weight comes from here, bypasses here to here. Okay. So what I hear, what I feel is, is that the weight isn't really getting to your hand. Can you try once even slow? Try it once slurred, all slurred. Ba -da -da -dee, all that slurred. Okay, so now in your ear, what did you hear? What did you like? What did you not like? Um, I liked the tone of it. I think it was like open and big. Uh huh. I think. Could maybe do more of it though, like have it deeper. Agree. So maybe try balancing the. Vary the bow speed a little bit. Maybe use a little bit more bow with also a little bit more contact. See what happens. But feel the weight in the string that balances. Because, you know, okay, here's the thing. We never think about terms like this, but how do you play loudly on a viola? Um, just more bow pressure and speed and. More like left ah, hand up. Speed. Speed. Yeah. Leave it at speed. Now, bow pressure is what makes it sound good, meaning it makes it sound deep, because we never really play loudly and not deeply. It just yeah. sounds, it sounds ugly, right? But volume comes from how much stick you use. Then timbre is how much weight or less weight. Mm -hmm. If you're light er or deep er, right? So you have to describe. I always, whenever I'm trying to make a sound, I always describe it to myself. I sing it to myself first, and then I go, okay, uh, lighter or deeper? So I ask you the question, lighter or deeper? Right now? Or yeah, really deeper. what would you yeah. say? Deeper. Deeper, okay. Um, how loud? Um, probably 
mezzo forte. I don't think it's completely forte, but that's a forte. I completely agree. You, you got me on both counts. Now, so that means that it's not a tremendous. It's not a tremendous amount of bow and not a tremendous amount of weight. But the right hand. And when you practice that slur. Then you use the exact same type of feeling that you would. Maybe not the same amount of bow as you did slurred, but the mm -hmm. same type of feeling of friction with mm -hmm. that left hand really in the string. Try it once, slurred, and just get that. It's not a lot of, you know. Just get that sound in your head. That's not bad. That's not bad at all. And I would say when you go to the C string, just get your arm over a little bit more. Feel that that underarm just opens up. Not that it opens up from the elbow, but that the underarm opens it up as one whole unit. Already much, much better. Now, do your bow stroke. The... And every single note. Even the separate notes have that core to the sound, right? Even the ones, because uh, shorter doesn't mean lighter. It just means shorter. Yeah. So always think of terms of how much core you're using with the string and how much bow. One more time, same thing. Excellent. Much better. Now, you put that with a little bit of vibrato, and we got, we're cooking with Crisco. Yeah. Right now, your left hand is kind of drier than the Sahara. So you have to make sure that... They actually did vibrate in the Baroque period. Gemignani, Locatelli, Corelli, Tartini, all of them actually had, a, a, they had um, etudes for vibrato. Gemignani, as far as calling it the big shake and the little shake. So did vibrate. You just, it was a different kind of vibrato because you didn't, actually this chin rest is the first chin rest ever developed. Huh. Or this is the first thing that ever was made before they had the plate thing. And you just sort of like hooked it and you just hooked in. I, I find it more comfortable, but that's me. People either love it or hate it. But before they had chin rests and stuff like that, yeah, you had to hold it more in your hand. And so it was harder to vibrate bigger. Okay, that's true, but they did vibrate. So it's kind of a fallacy to think that they, nobody vibrated in Bach's time, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. um, so that I would start adding vibrato too. Okay. So when you've got that, all those feelings put together, now it's creating sound. And you already, you're musical, right? You already know that you want to release those notes. You like that already, but now it's developing the voice that goes with that musicality. Okay. And that, and that depends on operating this apparatus and how you do it. So then if you for practicing, try practicing it sometimes just totally every note with vibrato or not every note eventually, but if you, that little bit will help. Just try a little bit of vibrato. Okay. And can I actually, can I see your left hand a little bit more? Can you move a little bit to your right? Yeah. Perfect. So if every, if your hand position, like I was telling Katie, if it was a little bit more out and the same on every string in every position, so that you don't play so straight, but more this, so that. You'll have a much bigger range of motion and much more, uh, I would say, more ways to vibrate. And vibrato is really just choosing which joint break goes the biggest and the fastest. 
Not that it'll always be big and not that it'll always be fast, but you should be able to do both. Mm -hmm. And we don't want two different types of technique. We want one type of technique that can do anything because two types of technique or three or four, it's complicated. I don't want to think. I want to be able to react and, and to do and to having to decide which techniques are one for the other. It's too difficult. So those are the things I work on because you're so naturally musical that it's a question of just developing the voice that goes with the musicality. Okay. So I would work on your on getting your hand position like I was talking to Katie, getting that vibrato, okay. making sure that you're talking about the balance of weight and speed, developing the, the timbres, the color, and the volume of what you want, while at the same time also getting the over. And the last thing I'll say. You do, you have this nervous tick about starting saying something, playing something before you play. And I think it's because you're afraid to scratch. Okay. Don't worry about that if your arm is high enough. So when you start, you're putting your bow. Imagine if I were leading a quartet. If you're over, you sort of go like and then that, right? If you can imagine, just get your bow already into that over feeling, like you're on the up bow feeling. That, and then you'll get rid of that. It'll be really easy to get rid of it. But I think what happens is you're afraid to scratch on the first note because it's an up bow. But that's easy to do if your arm's too low, like that. If my arm's too low, it's gonna scratch. Mm -hmm. I don't care who you are. You can be hyped. It's gonna scratch. It's called physics, <laughs> you know. So that's the and you know one way to practice how high your arm has to be is press as hard as you can. If you can't move across the string, if you can't move across the string at will, pressing as hard as you can, your arm's not in the right place. Real easy. All right. Great job. Stay as Great. musical as you are, Melissa. Stay as musical as you are. Just now start to develop the voice that goes with it. So that you're singing in just the voice you want to use. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Nice you know, job. Yeah. Really, really nice. When you hear Mr. Carr play, you notice that even the fast notes, every note gets its moment in the sun. Just because it's a 30-second note doesn't mean that it doesn't ring out with the same sound that every other note gets. And one of the things that really distinguishes advanced players from learners is that idea that every single note has to get played, no matter how fast. We can't just burn past them. I love it. I'm learning so much about how to coach strings better. What? Incredible. So, Audrey, let's hear from you. Hi. So I'm going to be playing a little bit of Lalo's Concerto in D minor. But Great. before I start, I actually want to apologize for any background noises because the lawn guys actually came earlier than anticipated. <laughs> oh, they're, they're... It'll be fine. Don't worry. We can't hear it, so. Thank you. 
Beautiful. Bravo. Great. Great job. So, Audrey, we're going to focus on three things. Mm -hmm. um, and none of them have to do with your bow arm. Everything has to do with your left hand. Okay. So, um, actually, that's not true. One slightly to do with the bow arm. But overall, I really like the, the, the kind of, of, of timbres that you use on your bow arm. I like a lot, especially the very beginning with like the big, robust sound. I love that. The one thing I'm going to talk about with your bow arm, mm -hmm. you've got to relax your fingers and your wrist. You know, like dum ba ga dum ba ya da dum ba ya da ga dum. Um, so, I mean, I'm not a cellist, but. Um, every time you change the bow, your wrists and fingers have to. So it's basically like the. Um, can you think about? I'm trying to think if it's the exact same thing on the cello. Yeah, when you go down bow. Everything flattens. Your 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 thumb should bend. When you go up bow, everything extends. So like the I'm trying to fit myself into a contorted position so you can see my hand. Mm -hmm. I'm like killing my back right now. But especially fast stuff. No matter what, move those fingers. Let's try the very beginning. Yes, that is what's going to give you a clear bow change, but also when you fast up, it's going to give you immediate sound. And here's a weird physics thing. Um, if I make this, this motion with my own hand, what kind of shape am I making? Like a circle-ish almost. Like a An ellipse, exactly. And ellipses keep going. Mm -hmm. They don't stop. When I go like this, there's a stop and a start. Mm -hmm. That's when you're gonna get clicks or when you get stops of vibration. When you have like ghost notes, you know when you have these ghost notes that sort of whistle? Yeah. It's because you lost contact with the string and the string stops vibrating and then you have to restart it. Mm -hmm. But if I'm the... If I stay on the same level and my fingers are moving... always has that motion. Right. So that's number one with your bow arm. Mm -hmm. The two other things I want to work on with you. Mm -hmm. And these are your biggest weaknesses by far. Number one, the way you shift. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Real simple. Mm -hmm. On any string instrument, I don't care what it is. Mm -hmm. That makes bass, viola, cello. The one thing I don't know about cello, because we don't use thumb position, right? Mm -hmm. On the violin. Like we don't do that. Mm -hmm. But I'm guessing it's the same premise. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, so I'm going to, there are three types of shifts. Mm -hmm. Well, they're called different semantics with different people. Some people call it same bow, new bow, jump. Same, some people call it same finger, new finger, jump. Some people call it overhand, underhand, jump. Mm -hmm. Lots of different expressions. I'll basically demonstrate them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's say I'm going to B to an F sharp. Like, uh, an overhand shift would be using the same finger and dragging the same finger and then, then basically substituting another finger at the end. Mm -hmm. Underhand would be using the same finger the whole time. Like immediately use, actually I'd say this one, immediately using the, the next finger. So if I'm going from first finger to three, I immediately use the free, three without going, without using the first finger to drag. Everything so clear so yeah. far? The other one is, if you can't do that, you gotta jump. <laughs> right. Right? Mm -hmm. You automatically try to hide every shift. But you don't know the shift before you hide it. That's a slight problem. Like if I asked you, what is your intermediate note? Like if I go from that B to that F sharp, my intermediate note is the D, the position note. And sometimes I'll go, not in the position, but as an extension. But I know what my intermediate note is. 
I doubt you could tell me. Right? Right. So um, can we go to the slow section? Mm. And I want you to goop the heck out of every shift you make. And I mean goop it. I want to hear the whole distance from point A. I want to know exactly how you're going to connect me to that note. You went one to one, right? Mm -hmm. And then the. Then you went to a two to four or something? One, one, and then a four. So one, one. Okay, one. Oh, I got it. Okay, so do it as, as much as you can. And I want you to feel the weight transfer. As if the first finger gives weight to the second finger. Exactly. Before you, don't hide a shift unless you have to. Mm -hmm. Meaning, and if you want to hide a shift, the first thing you should do to try to hide it, never get tense, by the way. We're always, like, we're always relaxed. It's, it's not about being light. It's about being heavy, but not being tight or blocked. Mm -hmm. But the first thing you gotta know is, if you want to hide it, shift later. So like, you know, if I want to not hide it, so I started shifting like way early. No. The later I put it, the less you hear it. And a lot of times when you're playing fast stuff, you don't even have to try to hide it because the speed will hide it. Let's try that. So. I want to hear every one of those shifts. Okay. So how would how would you describe that shift coming down? But, um, but think about which type of shift we talked about. Is it a replace shift? Is it a straight with the finger shift? What do you think? Um, I think it's like a same finger shift. The okay, try it. <laughs> ah, so it's a, it's exactly. You, it's the same finger then you replace, right? It's exactly right. And if you want to hide it, shift it later. Right? Mm -hmm. No matter what. And then if you're playing like a jump shift, or if I'm doing like a, what's a jump that I have to like the, that. I have to anticipate the weight necessary when I arrive there. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. But the problem is, is that when you shift, you're scared. And your finger never gets heavy enough when it arrives. But now, if you like, now keep going. Keep the same thing going. Every shift, make sure it's confident, and it's one of those three shifts. Yeah. Your second finger kind of was a little bit weak after the, the replace. When you replace, in the string. Yeah, go on, go on. Okay. 
yeah. head is like coming underneath mm -hmm. and then coming out the other side. Right. So these are the three types of shifts. That's all you got. And when you go into thumb position, there should still be some kind of weight supporting the finger after the thumb, right? So practice the connections, then hide the connection. But know them first, and then when you hide the connections, then at that point, you have to be able to sort of go over that connection, and then boom, solid finger on the other side. Mm -hmm. Now, last thing I want to work on. Mm -hmm. Same thing we were talking about with, with both Katie and Melissa, mm -hmm. vibrato. Mm -hmm. Vibrato is a joint break, but it's also a vocal joint break. And you, you ever seen the movie a Snow White? Did you ever watch that when you were a little kid? <laughs> okay, so Snow White basically singing it like, like ah, someday my prince will come. And she's like, she has this vibrato, it's like, <laughs> it's, like a, it's like a, like a gunshot. Like, <laughs> like a flood of vibrato. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is, is that it's not vocal. It sounds almost like artificial, like you're up, like you have like a, like a, a synthesizer, especially on a cello, mm -hmm. where a lot of it. The thing is, masculine and feminine. These are stereotypes or things that like they're ancient, right? Mm -hmm. But when you're talking about vocality of the instrument, that's what they thought about back then, whether it was masculine or feminine. Like my violin solos. In every piece you'll ever find in a, in a contramaster solo, I'm always a woman, always. Shahrazad, woman. I'm Heldenleben. I'm the hero's wife, always a woman, right? Mm -hmm. These were stereotypes that they used to describe treble bass. We can even call it treble bass, whatever you want to call it. It doesn't matter. What matters is the type of voice being used, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Dark, deep versus high. Mm -hmm. When you have a low voice instrument. The natural vocality of that instrument is warm, rich. Your vibrato has got to be bigger. Like even like the... If you can open the... joint you're going to use, whether it's the finger joint, the wrist joint, or in the cello case, I'm guessing the arm, mm -hmm. make it bigger. Can we try that? Without losing your finger weight, but make it bigger. Where should I start? Um... Wherever you like, I'm good. Bigger. Bigger. Uh... That E has got to be bigger. your teacher because I'm not a cellist but somehow you got to get your teacher to tell you how to open up whether it's with the arm getting the arm around the all those big notes bigger huge vibrato because you have a tendency of now you've gotten used to this sort of wiry vibrato in your head and you think that's expressive enough you got to have a different sound in your head and in order to do that you need a bigger motion those are the three things I would work on with you. Because you have the sound that you use with your arm, I like. The over underlying musicality, I like. I just, I just have a problem with the vibrato and the way you shift. Mm -hmm. All right. And then, to, then relax your fingers and your bow arm a bit more. Yeah. But, the, but work, I mean, the first things I would work on, shifts vibrato, without a doubt. Yep, we'll do. Thank you so much. My oh, pleasure, Roger. You, you sound amazing. Uh, do you have a private lesson teacher? Um, yes. Yeah. Who is that? Um, Mr. Zoltan. He, um, he's at a music school, Music Institute of North Texas. Mm -hmm. and, so um, ask Mr. Zoltan about like how to get a wider vibrato. Mm -hmm. To think about like which joints that you would use to get a more expressive and wider vibrato. It's not about speed, it's about amplitude about how wide the distance is. Good. You sound now, great, though. The thing about vibrato is, ah, uh, la, yeah, 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 yeah. There's a wah, yeah, wah, 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 And there's that two sides of yeah, 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 yeah. And you don't get, I only hear, yeah, 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 y
there's not enough distance to get the, the, the that kind of vocality. Okay. All right. Cool. Thank you, though. Thank you. Now I'm going to get a horn player. Hello. Yeah, man. So I, we're going to slightly adjust. We just heard a lot of solo work, and I want to just uh, make a quick disclaimer that um, both of the – these are our, our two principal uh, brass players. Argus is our principal horn, and Bradley is our principal trumpet. And okay. – they're just gonna play one short excerpt each. Sure. And it's important for everyone to remember that whether it's for a youth orchestra or almost any audition, you will have a string player on your committee. If you submit a recording to a festival, you will have a string player and, and strings, you will have brass players on your committees. What I learned is that string players and woodwinds look for different things in horn players than horn players look for in horn players. So to me, it is vitally important to hear what the concert master of the Dallas Symphony thinks about your horn and your trumpet playing. So without further ado, I'll let uh, Mr. Carr work with Argus. And well, uh, I was gonna say one thing before Argus starts. It was, I was coaching a flute player who's now associate uh, in, in Chicago. And so she went to IU and she was asked to take auditions. And she flew to IU, back to IU after not being in New Rome for a while. And so she asked me to, to so she was playing Daphnis and Chloe, the excerpt from Daphnis, this big solo flute part. And there was one part where I thought, it just sounded weird and it sounded awkward and I heard it play differently. I was like, I was like, is there any way to like get that to sound different in this way? And she said, well, the problem is the fingering and it's really hard and, and, and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, and I was like, then there must be a different way to finger that. And she was like, well, I don't think there is. And I was like, I don't know. I just, I, I've heard it in a different way. And so I said, let's go on YouTube. And so we looked at Emmanuel Paud, who was the principal flute player of the Berlin Philharmonic. And sure enough, he fingered it in a different way. And she played it afterwards. It was like, perfect. And I was like, I don't know. I'm a flute player. I don't know what it's like to do things on a flute. I have no idea. I do know what a great flute player sounds like. You know, I know what, I know what they've sounded like. There's a way to do it. There's got to be a way. All I know is, so with a horn, like I play with Dave all the time. I play with, I, I am, to say, I'm not going to say the bad word that goes along with it, but basically I've played the Brahms horn trio, I don't know how many times. So I've been the horn, I've been the horn wife for like, I don't I, probably 20 times at least with 20 different people. Mm. So I do know what a great horn sounds like. I can't tell you how to do it. Like I have no idea of armature. Dave told me once about filling up the mouthpiece or I'm not, like, he told me a couple things about how the horn works, but that I can't tell you, but I can tell you what it's supposed to sound like. You know, that's exactly right. And the, the horn is actually very simple. The air is the bow, you know, the, the same dynamics that you think about with your bow arm is the same way that we think about our lungs and our airstream. Huh. Anyways, Argus is going to play the recap, the third horn uh, excerpt recap in Till Oil and Spiegel. Oh, great. Hey, Mr. Carr. <laughs> hey, go for it. buddy it's fantastic i would say a couple things number one it feels like the coordination sometimes with your armature and the attack of the of the notes here isn't always exactly in sync with what you're doing with the hands make sure that it's absolutely i mean that's the thing about things that are difficult it requires an exactness so make sure that the, when you're pressing the keys down whatever you're or whatever you're changing to change the notes it has to be exactly at the same time two like the very first one. Can you play the first excerpt one more time? The very beginning of it. Like the very start? The very start. Okay, so I need a little bit more release on the long note, but I also need the low end of the sound. Uh, pa, pa, can you have a little bit more support from the from the breath? 
So it all sounds the same type of voice. One voice going higher and higher, but the same type of timbre going to the top. Ooh, that was so good. It was it was good until you made the ba 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 ba. I'm not sure what the horn the horn there, but you've got to have the attack has to be crisp and exact. The sound has to be immediate, whether it's from here, ba 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 ba, the the, uh, the armature creating that ba 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 ba, or whatever you do, keep that support from your breath. Always keep the support of your abdomen. All right, one more time. Yeah, Argus, again, what he's saying is that make sure you're not releasing either the corners or your support. You know, when you go, da, 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 di, da, da, those notes are still connected in your airstream just because you're articulating them doesn't mean that the air is not still unified. Exactly. Keep that air going through. Keep it flowing. Oh, that was so good. So that was excellent. What happened at the top? Ba, 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 yo. I need that to open up, which means you need more airstream. Ba, 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 yo. Open it like you're opening your mouth to sing. But is, is that just a click or two fast? You know, I think yeah. you, I would I would take, you know, three percent off of the speed there i guess yeah i think you start slower also then you'll have a more of a tiered effect better so what i want though is also Every note, even that ya ba 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 pi ba ba ba. Can you actually play it slowly once and just play it absolutely legato? So. What I want you to learn from that is which notes, when you were trying to connect them, which notes were the most difficult? Which notes were the hardest to speak? Which notes were the ones that you couldn't connect to? That's what I want you to work on, those connections. And then, then when you separate them, it's the same thing, just separate it. Right? One more time, slur it. And now slur it like you're playing it in, in real life, but slur it. Just slur it all, like tempo? Man. The whole thing, but, but in the style that you're going to play it for real. So ya da ya di da ya da da ya da di da ya da da ya da. Those notes di da ya da ya da. Those aren't somehow you're not connecting them well. So I would say, oh, try that di da ya da da ya da. Yeah, think H when he says ya. Think ha ha. So that which you want you have to practice. Dee da ya da da ya da. Dee da da dee da da. Connect those beautiful sounds all the way down, and then then separate them. What you're going to realize is that the articulation doesn't change what's happening down here. So basically, playing horn is a lot like playing violin. If you practice it slurred, it makes it more difficult. Making it more difficult, then you just put, make it separated. For me, it's actually more difficult to play something slurred than it is to yeah. play it separate. Yeah. So make it more, that's the whole point. Practicing ain't supposed to make it easy for you, buddy. Mm -hmm. you make it harder on yourself, and then the execution of the actual thing becomes easier. Right. But I mean, you've got, yeah, you've got ability, dude. You've got a ton of game, but hone your game. Make sure. every note like a singer. Don't think horn player, think singer. Mm -hmm. Think a singer's a la da 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 Every note, like a singer's voice, pure, but separated. All right? Good, sir. Great job. Really awesome. great. Thank you. Really great. Bradley, uh, 
can we get you in here, bud? And we want to, you know, move through here. We don't all have all day. Um, Bradley Brooks, our principal trumpet player. How you doing, man? Good. How are you? Good. Awesome. What do you like to play? I'm going to be playing pictures at an exhibition, the beginning. Great. Awesome. Can I just go ahead? Yeah, please. Very good, very good. Nice job, Brad. Okay, first thing, rhythm. You know, this, this whole opening is so majestic, right? You know, it's bom, 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 bom. Every quarter note that you play has two eighth notes. So all, whenever I think about basic rhythm, I always think about the subdivisions of notes. How many notes are within the beats of the big beats? So what I love what you're doing was you were sort of releasing the notes, like, Bom, pom, pom, pom. There was that beautiful release that you gave, which I loved. But sometimes your rhythm is on the little bit on the front side of the beat. And I don't feel like the whole note being played. Team, pom, pom, ta -dum, pom, ta -dum, pom. Also, the first note of the slur, ta -dum, pom, ta -dum, pom, pom, takes a little bit more of a weight to it, I think. So if you can think of, number one, playing the whole note out even through the release, of the subdivisions and making sure that the first note of the slur has a little bit more gravitas to it, a little bit more heft to it. Okay. Also, also last thing, be careful of the intonation of the D's. The D's can sometimes, can you be careful of the intonation of the D? Okay. The D's can sometimes be a little bit flat. All right. Let's try it. All right, sure. Now, so the sound also, never feel like you have to overblow it. Create a beautiful, warm, big sound, but never force the sound. Palm, palm, palm. Relax, support from your, your, your support from your admin support. But, but at the same time, you don't feel like you have to force the sound so much. I heard Chris Martin coach this excerpt and talk about bow weight on these oh. notes and, and likening the way you play it to, you know, if you had to do that on a violin, what would you do? I would sink in hum, pim, hum, hum. Sink into the front side of the note and then release a little bit the back side of the note. Ooh, I'm loving, loving, love, 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 love that sound. That's fantastic. Don't rush. Because one thing about violinists on your jury, man, we know, I've heard Chris Martin play it. I've heard every great, uh, like, I mean, my uh, trumpet player in Amsterdam was a guy named Peter Masurs, who had one of the most beautiful sounds I've ever heard in my life out of a trumpet. So I know what I'm used to hearing. But also, you're going to have, Everybody, there's always going to be one person on your committee that's going. And it's usually the person with the worst rhythm. So there's always that person who's going to be doing a metronome. Pim, pom, 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 pom. So again, front side the note, but that whatever sound you used to use, that relaxation, that lack of force, it was gorgeous. Now, pom, 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 pom. Don't rush. People who are in power like Kings, Regal, they don't rush. Hmm. Yes, sir. What I did differently that time is that with my breath, I took more air in. Fantastic. I'll remember that. Shocking, the next time. Shocking Bradley. Yes, sir. 
like it does a big difference and like because i did all instead of like like that, that so uh-huh. it made well, such a better call or even palm is a really good vowel sound for this paw 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 party paw and that's keeping that vertical stack in your mouth keeping that really nice round internal oral cavity okay yeah i'll try i'll try that breath yeah Phrasing off, um, um, like the, the, you go to the C, um, um, day phrase off, new beginning, um, 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 body, um, body, um, 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 so always know the phrase length. That was good. And the last thing I would say before we stop, just work on your pitch a little bit. Take a drone, but put the drone to the third, not the not the tonic. Okay. Quite often when we practice to a tonic drone, it actually sends us sharp. So if you put, if you put the, the drone to the third, then, then it'll, it'll, it'll really help you bring your pitch. I mean, well, if you, your pitch is actually a little bit low. So I would actually worry more about playing, playing the pitch on the low side. But that sound, man, that's it. That's the sound you need. So it's Thank that you. sound with, with, and I would put a metronome to it. You can even put the metronome to the eighth note. Ba, da, 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 da. So you really feel the internal pulse. But that sound worked a little bit on your pitch and a little bit with the metronome, and it'll be perfect. Right. Bradley, that was great. That sound will get you through all the auditions. But he makes a really important distinction about creating that tiered effect in the phrasing. It's You've got to show the music and not just play it all the same volume. But, dude really really fantastic improvement did we change the world there really great <laughs> great job so um, thank you so much pleasure mr carr alex thank you so much for your time we like to wrap with just a couple really casual questions um sure so let's let's do the fun ones first um what equipment do you play what bow and uh, what violin? I have a JB Viom. Uh, I mean, so uh, it's Jean Baptiste Viom, uh, 1853. My bow is a uh, Pajot. Very, the stick is even nicer than the fiddle. That doesn't mean anything to me, but people will watch and they will want to know that information. So, um, if you are stuck on a desert island and you can take one composer's complete catalog. <sighs> Sorry, what are you taking? Oh man, Beethoven. Nice, I love it. Can you identify one specific recording that you think all of these students should go find and listen to? My example is always Giolini in America, CSO, Mahler 9. Ooh, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. I would go, Carion La Boheme. It tells me everything I need to know. You've got some most beautiful sounds ever in one disc. You've got Pavarotti, you've got Mirella Freni, you've got the Berlin Philharmonic. Can't go wrong there. Can't go wrong there. Um, finally, and this is my favorite question, but also the hardest one of the day. Um, if you could go, you know, all these students are in that, that moment that I think back to being in ninth or 10th grade, and it's a lot. If you could go back and sit with your ninth or 10th grade self, are there some kind of golden nuggets that you would pass on to yourself? Yeah. Number one, tape myself more often. Number two, practice slowly more often. Number three, live without fear. Wow. I cannot thank you enough, man. Folks, this has been just 
incredible. I mean, uh, while we are separated and apart, we have this ability to be so together, man. I mean, we're, we're right here. So much fun. I had a great time with you guys. Really, you guys are doing a great job. And it's really nice. And it's funny, I don't know, I mean, I'm like, I'm, I'm in Dallas. And I never get to see a lot of the young people that are in Dallas, but it's really nice to know you guys are out there doing this stuff. Well, hopefully as we all come back together, I can continue to help connect our organization with the really fantastic classical music organizations we have in DFW. And uh, it's so important for me that everybody recognizes that, you know, they talk about New York and LA, but you know, there's a real hotbed of classical music here in Dallas, Fort Worth area. And we have two top class orchestras and we have some of the hardest working students and private lesson teachers in the whole country. Yep, I agree. And I think that, you know, if you guys, as much as, as often as you can, you know, I think that I'm, I'm not sure what we're doing to get, you know, to have, you know, price student tickets. I, I mean, I wish that, like, I hope that we're doing that at the, at, at the symphony. I have to look into that a little bit more. But, you know, one of the things is that just going to concerts, listening to people, listening to what's out there, you know, listen, you know, you've got YouTube, go on YouTube, listen to all these people all the time have influences that are on your, on your career, on how you make sound. On, I mean, look at what people do. I mean, I always tell my students, don't take my word for it. Don't ever take my word for it. Go on YouTube. You'll see that what I'm doing is what people who are really good do. Can we, what uh, we do. Can we turn our cameras on, Bradley, Sibby, Daniel, and we'll take a picture real quick? Yeah. Hey, Golden. Hey, man. Hey. All right, so we're just gonna take a quick shot here. If you got an instrument on you, pick it up. If not, no big deal. All right, hey, thank you all for being a part of our inaugural GNTYO Zoom Masterclass. And there are more to come, hopefully with uh, Alex's stand partner. Oh, fantastic. You're gonna love him. He's the best. All right, fantastic. take care, all. Alex. I don't know how to, to thank you enough. Um, you'll, you'll figure out how I can repay you and I'll let uh, you know. Man. man, I remember you're cooking. That's all I got to say. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. All right. Heard. All right. Well, have a great day. And again, thank care, you everybody. so much. We are all so grateful. All right. Take care. All right. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.